Thank you for coming over here, Ryan. This is being recorded right now on the 1st of December. Um, I am really sick. I have been in and out of bed all day. I've got a cold. Uh, you're not feeling sick at all? I am feeling great. You feel great? Hopefully I don't get a cold from you. Yeah, hopefully hopefully you do not. This one's pretty gross. I think it's just the cold weather, man. Um, <laughs> it's getting uh, really wet, really cold out here in Seoul. Um, so... This recording that we did for the podcast that's going to be played, this was recorded, I want to say, like two months ago. Yeah, about Is that two right? Two months ago. That sounds right yeah. to me. Yeah. And so this recording, uh, I think, was actually one of our best ones yet. We interviewed uh, Jean He from UIU. Uh, she is the co owner of the team UIU, which is a very new esports team that was founded in 2017. We talk about a lot of interesting stuff in this podcast. I think you guys are really, uh, really going to like this. This is one of those people where. Just a few minutes into the conversation, you think, oh, this person's very smart. And um, we had a really interesting conversation. Uh, do we have any announcements or anything we need to make, Ryan? We're going to be having a um, December Patreon update coming within the okay, next two right. weeks. So people can be on the lookout for that. Okay. And um, there's nothing else for, for me for the whole year. So I got sick right on time, man. <laughs> we finished the KSL finals, and I can lay around my house and feel horrible until I recover. Uh, the holiday season is here. Christmas music is playing now I'm in the grocery store. You don't? Do you not like Christmas music? It's too uppity for me, man. Like it's too cheerful. Like I don't have that. <laughs> okay, for it, some like, reason it, it grinds me down. I can't handle it. No, for some reason, man, I actually enjoy Christmas music now. Really? Yeah. I if it's Christmas time and the lights are out, I, I do not mind it. It gets okay. me in a good mood. I'm getting more festive as I get older. <laughs> I think I'm appreciating holidays more and more. Um, uh, as always, guys, uh, support on Patreon goes a long way. It really does make a huge difference for us over here in Seoul as we continue to produce and develop this show. So if you can give us support on Patreon, it's patreon.com forward slash tasteless podcast. Even a small donation really does go a long way for us. It's really appreciated. Um, and I guess that does it for introing the show. Now you're going to hear a not sick version of me from two <laughs> months ago with Jeannie. Enjoy. So you grew up in Seoul for a very little bit and then you moved abroad. Is that correct? Yes. So I was born in Seoul and I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio in 1969. But now you're based in London, right? I am. I'm supposed to be living in London, but I'm rarely there. Yeah. And when did you go to London? Um, I think it was 2010. 2010. Mm -hmm. So you're about as international as you can get then. I mean, this is... uh, yes, I've been okay. So uh, born in, in Seoul, moved to Cincinnati, um, went to school in, in Cambridge, then worked in Boston, New York, uh, lived in Cambridge, England for a while. Then I think Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, Hawaii, and then London. So, yeah, I might have missed a place. That's crazy. So, do you do you identify with one location in the world more than another? Um, I was said I, I I feel like I'm a Midwestern girl because that's where I you know my my formative years. Um, but then I kind of call Hawaii home too. I lived there for close to nine years and there's something about that place that speaks to my heart and so i still even though i've lived now in london for i think longer um i think of it as home where where do you end up spending most of your time on an airplane <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you've gotten um you enjoy traveling more now or, or you enjoy, enjoy i mean the commute by the way more or less now because i used to love airports when i was a kid in kansas like i thought you can it's get on an so airplane. exciting, right? Yeah, I thought you can get on an airplane and go anywhere. Uh -huh. And now I sort of, I find like a, going to an airport like a, such a chore. So my husband said um, a funny thing like, a long time ago when we were much younger. He says, he said, tell the kids, be careful what you wish for. It might come true. <laughs> and um, because he said when he was young, he always wished that he could like travel around the world and stay in fancy hotels. And so his career necessitated that he's like i think to your point like uh um anything when you have to do it for too much it's but i still enjoy i, I enjoy the the destination um yeah, the travel's yeah. hard 
but I, I mean, you're going for a reason and whether it's an event or something. So I enjoy once I'm, I'm there and meeting all the people and all that. So, yeah, no, I, I found, I appreciate travel, especially as I get older more and more, but there's something about airports that I just tend to be like, oh man, <laughs> it's hard to get through, you know? I think also back before travel was a little bit nicer and then now yeah. with all the restrictions and the way that security and, well, and then how do you, like, you have to pay for everything you know I mean yeah the, like the if you have service, an extra bag you know, the or... service is, it's just made it really unpleasant but I think maybe like 20 years ago it was still a little bit more it's cool to be is, is that more just US airlines or is that I think so because I, when I... I fly the Asian ones which I try to book those if I'm coming out here the service is just so much better and then you get like your two bags and you get free meals and I've always felt like there's something super aggressive about American Airlines you know what I'm talking about? Like, like lately, or I guess post 9 11. Um, Have you experienced yeah, that? Right? Don't, don't ever talk back or don't ever look the wrong way at a flight yeah, attendant yeah. kind of thing. So, <laughs> so you've been um, working in esports now or gaming now. Um, for some time, but you have a, a, a long history before you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because most of my viewers are, are from StarCraft, so mm -hmm. they might not be as familiar with mm. UIU. No, yeah, because we're generally um, in the fighting game community. So right. um, prior to um, co-founding UIU, um, I've had, since I am much older than most of your listeners, um, I've had a varied career. So um, started off after university um, in management consulting. Um, and then from there, um, went into fashion. So um, went and got a, a, a degree in fashion design. And um, yes, from uh, giving advice to Fortune 100 companies <laughs> on strategy, I went to like designing um, menswear at Ralph Lauren back in the late 80s. Um, and then after that, um, started, I was talking about the traveling, um, moved to London and then, um, not London, Cambridge, England, and then, um, out to Singapore and those places. And so there I was kind of um, raising children, so I had three kids. Um, and then after that, when we moved to Hawaii, I got a law degree and um, was practicing corporate law. Um, and at the same time, I developed um, an early learning curriculum. That's for like, um, like workbooks and things for um, kind of the preschool kindergarten kids. And from that, um, that's when the App Store opened. Uh, if you can think all the way back to when the first iPod Touch came out, even before the phone, um, I thought it was a really interesting way for young children to um, practice their motor skills because you could draw on the interface. So um, developed some of the first like learning apps for that technology. So it started like, that kind of like um, started my journey into a little bit of tech. Um, this is a long story, guys, so <laughs> hang in there. No, um, please, please. And then I moved to London. Um, and when I moved to London, um, got, a, uh, got a job developing um, a bunch of like mobile games um, with a, a gaming company there. And um, it seems like I like to multitask. Um, so at the same time as that, I started my own startup too. Um, and it was a, a, a kind of a fashion shopping app. Um, that used location uh, on your phone and the photos and everything to like kind of see inside of stores that were around you and shop within that. So um, did that, moved out to Silicon Valley um, just because of the funding and, and whatnot. So um, did that for several years and then that startup got acquired. And then uh, after that was kind of mentoring other founders um, and thinking about, you know, interesting areas to to uh, go into, and then that's when um, UIU kind of happened. So how long has UIU been around? Just a little bit over two years. Over two years. Mm -hmm. You're working in a part of gaming that I find um, for like quote unquote outsiders, it's it's hard to penetrate. It's hard to get into. Mm. Um, why fighting games? Mm. Um, uh, there's a lot of different reasons, but um, it kind of, uh, one of the reasons goes back to why we ended up in the U.S. from Korea. Uh, my father taught martial arts to the U.S. Army back in the early 60s. And um, he was invited by 
the ROTC program in Cincinnati to come over and, and teach them martial arts. So that's why we ended up in Cincinnati. So from the time I was born, I've just kind of, martial arts has been a part of my life. Um, he helped bring Taekwondo to the U.S. Uh, whenever I drive through small towns in the U.S. and I see Taekwondo schools in the smallest city in, you know, in Texas or something, I, I know that my father was one of the people that was responsible for bringing that over. Um, so my weekends were spent um, going to tournaments. He would uh, either throw them himself or um, we'd be traveling to other cities and, and um, you know, helping with the tournaments. So um, when I, w with fighting games, even though it's, you know, it's in the arcades or it's on your PS4 or something. There's something that's just like, you know, resonates with me because I just grew up with that all the time. Um, it's, it's 1v1. It's super easy to understand. Like, even though I don't really play that stuff, I, I can understand what's going on and I can appreciate seeing some of the other games for someone that's not actively playing that game is it's a little bit difficult to understand, right? So um, anyway, so we've I have the background in like martial arts and the kind of transfer it to there. Um, and, um, and Drew, my co-founder, has also been a really big fan of fighting games, of MMA, all of that type of stuff. So we were just naturally drawn, drawn to that. Um, I really like the community. I found that the community was incredibly diverse, um, you know, uh, socioeconomically, uh, it's just super global. Um, it's very inclusive. When I'm looking at the positive side of everything, it was very inclusive. Um, um, gender, race, all of that. And so for me, I, I found that really, um, uh, I was really attracted to that. Um, it's a very close-knit community too, a lot of grassroots um, activities. And, and so that also resonated with me. Um, and uh, like I said, it's 1v1. I thought it would be really interesting to tell personal stories with the players. Um, one of the things that we were really interested in was creating interesting life content around gaming and around um, the players, the, the, the people around, not just the players, content creators, the casters, whatever, right? And um, I think it's a lot easier to do when you choose a genre that is 1v1. Um, and so that's just that's a few of the reasons. Did you connect more with um, a specific fighting game or was it FGC in general? Like, were you more into Tekken or Street Fighter or? Um, I think just even like when I was in college and um, they had like the the cabinets and the dining hall and things and, and the folks were playing like the Street Fighters and, and whatnot. Um, and so... You know, that, I think Street Fighter and more Tekken, like I, I think Tekken's a beautiful game. And so when I watch it, I, I just, I could watch it for hours and hours. Um, uh, some of them are a little harder for me to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to understand. Or some of them, it's, uh, they, they, uh, my team always uh, teases me because like Mortal Kombat, it's so violent. So that when we picked up our first... <laughs> When we were when we were scouting for some players, sorry, it, it, don't, please don't cover your mouth. Sorry. Yeah. So when we were um, we were scouting for uh, Mortal Kombat players, and I was like, I'm sorry, guys, but I'm just not going to be able to watch it because it's so <laughs> gory. Have you seen the? Uh, you know the fatalities, right? Where they yes. Murdered? Yes. So <laughs> yeah. so then I'll, I'll like um I, like our players are doing really well. I like yeah, Evo. Yeah. I'm like I was sitting there trying to cheer them on, and I close my eyes, and I can still hear like what's happening because the <laughs> blood's like. <laughs> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> that's a game that absolutely stayed true to what it <laughs> what it started out as i think it's that's banned in korea probably it's banned it's banned most countries they don't they do not give a fuck man <laughs> they're still doing what they're doing um yeah i know it's it's uh to go back to what we were talking about earlier um there's so many different fighting games yes um it seems like and i don't know if you have an opinion on this or not but it seems like uh, out of all the genres that there are, so you know, uh, shooting games, uh, MOBA games, mm -hmm. it seems like fighting games. There's the least, in my opinion, and from my view, and I do RTS, but uh, the least amount of tribalism. Mm 
Mm. Would you agree with that? It seems like in fighting games, even though everybody who plays their fighting game thinks theirs is the best yeah. and theirs is the most difficult and takes the most skill, it seems like there's a an understanding that everybody's got to stick together in FGC. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why it's called the fighting game community. Right, right. There's the word community in there. Right. They don't have that in MOBAs. Like if you talk to Dota players or League players, uh -huh. it's like the, the other side is alien. Uh -huh. Do you have any um, ideas on why that is the case in fighting games? Mm, maybe they have to stick together because, <laughs> I, yeah, maybe because they're... Mm, it is grassroots, it's smaller numbers. Um, and so, in, oh gosh, I'll probably offend some people, but like if you're not like at the cool kids table, maybe you have to band together. Like you're not Overwatch, you're not this. And like, I don't know. Um, but I, I think it also speaks to that it is so like diverse and inclusive and, um, and it is like community driven. So it's hard to just stay siloed in. Like if you're a Tekken player, or if you're a Street Fighter player, you need to kind of, pull all of those games together in order to have enough um, mass to like put on some local tournaments or something like that. And yeah. Do you think that's all publisher related as well? I've always felt like, and I'm not obviously not anti-publisher, but it seems like um, the game publishers are more aloof or have been more aloof in fighting games than compared to like, let's say Riot, for instance, mm. which Riot is completely hands-on in control mm -hmm. of, of their one game. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like uh, fighting game publishers, um, historically at least not as much. I think they've let the community drive a lot of the activity. So, you know, they, they, they publish the games, um, but then in terms of um, the tournaments and, and all of that, it it's really has grown from the users and the local communities. Um, and... You know, I think things are maybe will change in the in the future. I don't know if you've kind of heard all the rumors about the right fighting game and whatnot. And I've heard about that. Mm -hmm. They're going to be releasing a fighting game, and I don't know what's going to happen. I'm so curious about this. I mean, I'm I'm based in in Seoul. Uh, League is insanely big out here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, but they're going to drop a fighting game. So that's the word on the street. So yeah, yeah. and then even um, Capcom has um, been experimenting with different formats in addition to their pro tour that they have. So this past year, um, they tried the Street Fighter leagues uh, in Japan and also in the U.S. And I think there's been a lot of learnings and success from that. And next year, you'll probably see, you know, a second iteration of that. Um, so I think there's more. Now there's starting to be a, a bit more involvement um, besides just, just having the, the pro tours. Um, but even outside the pro tours, it's still so much community driven. For instance, like Tekken um, this year, they um, created this uh, dojo system. I don't know if, if you heard about that, but before. Yeah. yeah, can you explain that for the people listening? Yeah, so um, before with the Pro Tour, you, you had like the, the master events, which give you a lot more points, and then the, the challengers, which were a little um, were regional. And I think um, my, my thinking is that uh, they wanted to grow the communities, um, uh, the local communities, right? And also give. A lot of players um, that don't have the resources to be uh, flying all around the world to collect these points, opportunities also get some points. So they came up with a system called the Dojo. And any local tournament organizer can put on a tournament. And depending on how many entrants you have, you um, get a certain number of points for that. Right. So we just threw one yesterday here um, in Korea. And we did a 60, we capped it at 64 because the venue was rather small. We wanted everyone to be comfortable. But the winner of that got dojo points that went towards the, the, the finals for the world tour. So I think things like that are really wonderful um, and speaks to like the, the whole like building of community. It gives um, local tournament organizers a, a chance to, you know, organize a tournament, prove themselves. Maybe if they do a great job and the community gets behind them, um, Next year, they might get a chance at being a challenger event. And um, and then also the local community to uh, for them that um, 
the folks that don't have the resources to like travel out of state or whatnot um, to get really good tournament experience. So I think it's I think it's really wonderful and it really speaks to like the fighting game community. I hope I hope more publishers kind of try that approach. Yeah, there's this interesting relationship that uh, like publishers have with the people that play their games where it's like you know you they make the game but then these other people sort of take over mm. and become essentially more knowledgeable about the game more centered on the game than even the people that, that made the game and there's always this i don't even know where i stand on this but you know the, it's fascinating to see how much control publishers exhibit versus how much they kind of like let people go with it but now with esports having so much money uh, competitive gaming having so much money involved uh, it's it's going to be fascinating to kind of see where each of these publishers goes and and, and how much control they exhibit um do you do you and, and correct me if i'm wrong on this but mm -hmm. it seems to me like um so far fighting game publishers have exhibited less control is that uh, over their community uh, less guidelines less restrictions in broadcasts um is is that, do you have an opinion on that? Is that good or bad or or what? Um, yeah, I think except for how they dictate the the world tours, um, that yeah, they've they've allowed a lot of the community to come up with events and you know the fact that we were able to just throw one too and um, so I mean I I don't know how that's gonna go in the. I don't know if they're going to try to, uh, with fighting games too, as you were saying, like there's so much money being put into it. Like, I think we're kind of, wait, well, the money's not there in fighting games right now in terms of prize winnings or sponsorships and whatnot. So there's more room for, I guess, experimentation. Yeah, probably more room for growth. I'm curious because like, you know, I my game is StarCraft, so that's Blizzard Entertainment. And like uh, the other guys that I know that work out here, it's all League. Right. Mm -hmm. Besides the FGC guys I go, but there's always frustrations with even though there's money being poured in how much control a publisher exhibits or mm -hmm. or them being concerned about the, the image of the company. Mm -hmm. Like one thing I find very liberating about fighting games is, is sort of or I should say FGC is that is how open it is, how, mm -hmm. how real, how raw they are, how real <laughs> they are in comparison to something which is uh, quite manicured like League of Legends. And mm -hmm. that's not an that's not an anti league statement, but it's like. There's something to that. It's, yeah. 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 But that's what's really attractive about the FGC. You can yeah. just show all kinds of, that's when I say like it's super diverse, you get the most interesting personalities in there. Um, you know, fun, entertaining, super toxic too. And <laughs> yeah. you just like, you know, it's, it's super inclusive and super, you just get, it's you get it's, more characters it's, yeah it's the world man it's the world yeah. it's like it's not an, an aesthetic yeah like what you said it's not homogenized it's just it's just yeah yeah it's not sterilized and watered down no and, stuff. and i think they actually like when um they do these like street fighter leagues and things they try to show all these di di diverse personalities and like yeah. courts and all and stuff so i think it's super entertaining it's more like um wwe it's a little that's bit what i was thinking like, yeah little, like it's just Really the theatrics is more real it's it's so cool like so uh just to shift gears here for a second uh -huh. you're a team owner you have this incredible brand it's very new um how does one make that how do, what does the beginnings of that look like hmm. like how do you start that how do you start because there's only a couple of these in the world uh-huh right I think for an average person, actually even a fan of competitive gaming, mm. I think it's hard to conceptualize how somebody sees the beauty of, you know, in competitive gaming and then becomes a powerhouse brand. How, how does, what, what does that look like? <laughs> um, hmm. Like what are the first steps um, you take to, to make that? Yeah, so I mean, as I said, um, my co-founder Drew has been always a, 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 an avid follower and a fan of of the genre, and um, he he got to know certain um, I guess more influential uh, people in the community, um, and we reached out to a few of them to get some advice um, because it is a really even though it's very uh, 
like I said, super inclusive and, and inviting and whatnot, but it's also, um, if you're an outsider and, and they have such a legacy, right? It's, it's been around for decades and these people have, um, kind of grown up through their local scene and all that. So if you're an outsider, I think sometimes they're a little bit suspicious of like somebody, you know, coming in. Um, so we get some advice from people that are super well respected in in um, in the area, um, but I think because we were coming in uh, initially to about content, like we said, like showing personality and, w and whatnot, and as we were trying to work on that, we realized that um, we actually started meeting some some players um, online and and. Uh, some of their struggles to, in order to like try to travel and and compete because, like I said, it's not the prize money is not there and a, a lot of them are, you know, driving places, um, sleeping on the floor type of thing. And so, um, kind of it spoke to my, because oh, I'm a mother, I was like, oh, I need to help these <laughs> these kids that yeah. have these dreams and whatnot. And so, um, we just started. It kind of. It wasn't by design, actually. It kind of happened. I know this is going to sound crazy, but it kind of happened where the first person we kind of sponsored to a tournament, um, he was just short of a few points to qualify for the finals. And so we were like, oh, let's send you to that last tournament so you can try to qualify. And, you know, just paid for, for his flight and hotel and all that. And then that led to another person and so it was me just, well, it was us trying to give some opportunities to people that were just like on the cusp of, of, of some of their goals. Um, and, um, we realized that like, that was very rewarding. Um, and, um, also then that allowed us to have some people to build content around, meaning like stories of, of these people. Um, and then, so we started, I start. I mean, we've been watching other players. Um, our first like international player that we signed was from Korea. Um, and we were just watching like their streams and, and whatnot. And um, once again, I, we our, our, um it's a way we've always operated um, was to find people who had a lot of potential and who hadn't gotten the, um, the chance to, like we said, travel, because that's the t the tournaments are happening all around the world, and you have to t uh, pay out of your own pocket to go to these things, right? So, um, for him, like we just saw a lot of potential and saw a great personality, and um, and we were nobody, like we were nobody. So, like we have to really thank the first players who took the leap of faith and, like, who are you guys? Like, where are you from? Like, um, and said, okay, yeah, I'll be sponsored by you right um it took i think a, a big leap of faith to associate with two people who like are outside the community and didn't really have um a track record but um great things happened to our early players with the support i mean we knew that they had the ability and so once they had the opportunity to start traveling they started doing really well um i have great personalities too so created like a lot of um fans in the community and um, I think we just grew together that way. And so as, and we're very hands-on, like we traveled to all the tournaments and we're there supporting the players. Um, I just assumed that that's what all team owners do, but I heard that that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times people are like, you're here at the tournament? Like, wow. Dude, some teams are so <laughs> aloof or, so, and there's, or, or just, I've met, I mean, I've been working in esports for a long time. I've met some team owners that are so gross, oh. or so just like, so just there for the money. It's it's um. Well, maybe, what's funny is there's not that much money yet. I to was be gonna made, say but, like there's no, there's not really money in it. But, so. <laughs> but you'll see people who think they're gonna you know there's some cash grab here and um, no it's yeah. I think we're for several y more years it's it's about building and building and you're not gonna really see. Um, much return on that investment is trying to help the communities grow um, so that it, people do have opportunities, whether they're pro players, content creators, you know, guys, people doing marketing or business. Like at, at this point, we need to be investing a lot um, to grow the ecosystem, to give everybody opportunities. And that if you're thinking that it's like, because you hear like how big the market is or whatever deal you hear about some brand, 
like sponsoring somebody and people from the outside are thinking like yeah there's all this money and it's like right. no that's where you see them leave after a year six months or a year because they're it's not you have to invest a lot into this this is something that's fascinating me because i feel like the way I know that FGC people occasionally don't like it referred to as esports, yeah, but just just right. for the sake of comp having the conversation, yes. let's refer to it as esports. I think the way that it is uh, explained in the media mm -hmm. with all this money and all this stuff happening, and then what's actually going on, mm -hmm. where it's like maybe one percent, two percent of the people in this ecosystem are actually mm -hmm. making a living solely off of this. Mm -hmm. I. I I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm just saying this idea out loud. I'm curious what, what, what your thoughts are on it. But I find there's so much falsehood in how esports is reported on. It's publicly. glamorized. It's yeah, glamorized. Yeah. And so coming from an, another industry with fashion that's totally glamorized, um, I mean, that's the job of the media is to, uh, you know, hide all the warts and make everything seem super sexy. So working in fashion, everyone thinks, oh, you're there like, you know, with your little mannequin and there's fashion shows and models and, <laughs> and like, mm, no, that's like maybe 2% of the time, right? 98%, 95 to 98% of the time is just grind work and it's shit and it's working with factories and bad, you know, whatever and, and whatnot. And so, but you don't see, I mean, that, who's, that's not gonna sell magazines. Right. Right. And same with, I think, esports. Like most of the people that are able to make a living out of it are grinding every day. They're hustling so hard. And they're also not wealthy. No, no. The best. They're getting by. Yeah. The best that, that, that are, the people that are doing okay are, are rich at best. Mm. Nobody has fuck you money. Mm. It, it, but I, 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 I've been so intrigued because when I, see gaming reported in the news. So I'm 35 years old, right? I'm used to, when I was a kid, okay, games are going to cause violence. Right. And, and this is dangerous or it'll destroy your brain somehow, which is totally absurd. Um, into watching the media now talk about gaming as this is going to make you rich. Uh, Fortnite. Yeah, for, yeah, you're going to make three million being a Fortnite. We're all going to be ninja. We're all going to be ninja, <laughs> right? That's a whole other phenomenon that's worth talking about. But there's this whole... Uh, a thing that's happening where now it's being reported instead of it being talked about as like for instance community building uh it's stimulating for your brain now it's talked about as some sort of uh like it's bitcoin or something mm -hmm. like like like, like we, these people that are doing this they're the ones making the money when in reality and i've met so many pro gamers like the best in the world i've met so many none of these people are are, are uh, even millionaires they've made at most a couple hundred thousand in prize money. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear what you're going to do next. It, yeah. You know, there's yep. there's no, yep. you know, in, in Ninja, uh, th that's another fascinating point to talk about, but he's not even a pro gamer. He's a streamer. Mm -hmm. And he's also, in, in a way, kind of edited his personality to be palatable to, like, the Ellen show or, mm -hmm. or this other stuff. But within esports, it just seems like, and I guess that's what I wanted to ask you, is like, what is going on where people are reporting how, like, quote unquote, well people are doing uh, when it, that, that, that is simply not true? Right. So it's really interesting in that let's just say take the two year span that that we've been formally, you know, officially in existence. Um, I remember like the first sponsor deck that we were working on. We had clips from all these news programs going like, um esports like laughing at it and like the talk show host like laughing about this like these. right yeah about like what do you mean like playing computer games getting paid for that like yeah that's ridiculous that's not a sport and you know and i get that like i'm i'm middle-aged so i get that on my facebook where my high school friends are like but you should tell them to put the computer, you know, turn off the Time computer to go outside. and go outside. That's not a real sport and all of this. So yeah. you go from th that narrative just two years ago where they're like laughing about it on CNN or CNBC or like all the talk shows to now like, oh, uh, especially with the Fortnite stuff. And, and, and it's like... Um, and then you, you you get the news about like the valuations of some of the the you know tier one sports teams and all these celebrities coming in like Drake and whatnot investing and and we're talking like 
billionaires now and all this. So like within that short span of time, the narratives change from what the hell to like, oh yeah, no, no, everyone wants to be a pro gamer. So they, the news cycle needs stuff, right? And it's yeah. just so interesting how it just, it's like just changed like that so fast. It's also odd because, and maybe this is in part the fault of the people that, um, you know, started trying to market esports. But when people talk about esports numbers, they're talking about any competitive game anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where like, if we were to talk about sports numbers, mm. like, well, that would include American football, cricket, you know, <laughs> everything. Where, uh, I mean, sure, esports is big, but it's actually segmented into these groups that are oftentimes not that interested in each other. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the news cycle. It's a news story. Yeah. It's it's something kind of shiny that they can mm, report about. And like I said, I just it's their job to glamorize things, and so they'll they'll pick up the the success stories. Which I mean, that's what news does, right? So you you'll hear about the success stories, or if someone wins a lot of money um, somewhere, that gets reported, and then the young kids who love gaming, and then they're like, "See, mom, I told you, I can make a living <laughs> out of it. Let me keep playing Call of Duty, kind of thing." And so, yeah. The reality is, though, it's not a lucrative thing right now. So we're in, this is recorded in South Korea and Seoul, where esports really started. Um, you're an international person, truly. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always wondering what people think about uh, in, in, with this question. Why is this not bigger in Japan? I mean, Japan is where Nintendo started. Um, I mean, a lot of people in the West would associate Japan with gaming first and foremost, right? Right. But it's esports, competitive gaming is actually the smallest in Japan. Right, right. In the Asia region, like like it, Thailand is bigger in esports. Right. Or... It's starting to change. I know you, when I think of esports, like I've, I've been into a lot of things coming out of Korea for the past 15 years. So like the rise of K-dramas, K-pop, K-beauty, now the food. And and I saw what was happening in esports, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and also in, in Europe, it was kind of picking up. It wasn't a thing in the, the US. Um, I think with Japan, because it was so much of the arcade culture at first, right? And a lot of the games that they developed were these kind of like one v one, and they didn't have the internet. I think what really um, shifted that paradigm was in Korea after the um, financial crisis, where the government then like um, invested a lot into the infrastructure of the internet, broadband, all of this. And and um, I've heard there was a, a you know the economy was bad, the kids were staying at home and playing games over the internet, right, and PC bongs and things. And so there was a, more of like a um, ecosystem available for more of this like kind of competitive uh, maybe team gaming um, versus like Japan, the arcade culture. It's more like the salarymen and things like the kids would kind of sneak into the arcades and whatnot. Um, I think also the laws were different. I know that in Japan, um, there's a strong like anti-gambling law. And so yeah. they view um, prize money and things from competitions it could kind of get interpreted as, as gambling, right? And so I know that recently they've had, um, Jezu was created, they've um, started a working, um, the government bodies have been starting to work around how to um, uh, interpret the, the anti-gambling law and allow for um, prize money, right? So now you can get pro licenses, um, so, uh, uh, like the Street Fighters and Tekken players, um, they have now gotten uh, pro licenses so that they, they can actually like take home a lot of prize money. So within the last, especially the last year, we've seen so much more activity in Japan with these um, great tournaments and fighting games. They just had like a great one with one, um, one sport that's a new um, MMA um, organization that's come out of Singapore. They threw a giant like um, festival where they had uh, mixed martial arts and then they had Tekken and Street Fighter championships happening at the same time too. Um, there's So I think it's changing now in Japan in that they're starting to, to embrace it. It's also um, console culture, whereas like places like Korea, China, um, Europe is PC culture. And I think a lot of that esports growth was first happening within like PC-based games. 
um, whereas yeah, Japan is much more console based. Yeah, I've only been. This is so weird. I've only been to Japan one time. I thought when I went to Japan, it was going to be very similar to Korea, and it totally, it's totally not. Very different. Like they're, I guess it's fair to say that Korea and Japan are more similar to each other than like if you go to China, for instance, or or, or some other Asian countries. But mm -hmm. they're still totally, totally um, different culturally, and I guess different attitudes on technology. I, mm -hmm. I found like um, when I'm in South Korea, like my card will work everywhere. Um, it's easier to get Wi-Fi. I don't know. There's something about, like, for instance, in Japan, companies still use fax machines. Uh, yes, they handwrite tickets and things. And yeah, yeah, and they don't a lot. Of, yeah, I so, don't. I don't know if that's why esports isn't as big there as well, or, or or not. But it does seem like there's certain cultures where the relationship with technology is different. And that's ironic because you, when you think of Japan, you think it's yeah. super tech and robotic and all that. Giant and, robots. And, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and 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 it is, but they also have like the way of doing things traditionally too so it's an interesting interesting mix but um yeah i think um they're so near each other but culturally they're really different and i would think that actually korea and china are maybe a little bit more um you would say similar, more similar maybe personality wise i don't know Koreans are pretty aggressive and in your face, so yeah, that, <laughs> they, I guess that's true. they say what's on their mind. And yeah. <laughs> when you go to Japan, everything's so polite and all this. In Korea, they're like, you know, they don't like you. They let you know right away. <laughs> so, um, in the news, have you have you seen this news with the Hearthstone thing uh, and, um, and Blizzard? Kind of and just I haven't looked really into it, but I so, I, I know that it's it's so, happened. Yeah. So basically. Uh, at risk of opening the gates of hell here. <laughs> we don't have to have this in the podcast if you don't want to. Um, a Hearthstone player from Hong Kong was banned after winning a tournament. Mm -hmm. um, he had an interview where he he, he was saying, you know, support yeah. Hong Kong, the mm -hmm. revolution of our times. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Blizzard uh, banned him, took his prize money. Mm -hmm. The internet went yes. insane. Yes. He, he's now, he's got, he has a, I think, a t is it, Ryan, is it a six-month ban now for him? Six-month six ban. The commentators, I think, have been unfired or something. I think it's yeah, I'm not band. sure why the commentators got fired, but from what I understand, because they, they, they knew that they it was going to happen, they, they were they were uh, Taiwanese uh, commentators and sort of knew. Oh, they were Taiwanese. Yeah, they're Ta Yeah. Was this tournament in Taiwan? It was. It, well, I believe it was. I believe it was all done remotely. So he was in Hong Kong. You know, they have like webcams. Right. Um, and the commentators. Were the Taiwanese. commentators were in a tiny studio in in Taipei. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, there's many. Uh, people in China watching. Of course. This guy said this. Right. Um, he got banned. Now, he's been unbanned, but um, I, I, what, what I was trying to get to was basically, what, what, what is your thoughts on, on, on China's, I guess, growing control of, of uh, speech in the world, but also, I guess, speech and gaming as well? Because esports is, I think, literally as international as you can get right now. Yeah. There's not anything that's more international than esports, and so this is an international issue. It's going to be very interesting yeah. the next year on how this plays out, right? Yeah. So, um, if I'm correct, um, there's a large Chinese ownership in in Tencent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Too. Also. Um, so they so they have just for the listeners, so they have shares in a. I think they own 100 percent of League of Legends, Riot, I should say. Uh, can you look up how much the shares they have in Blizzard? So, so I, I know correctly. they're in Riot, right? They own Riot. Mm -hmm. They have, I want to say, forty-five percent shares in Epic. Um, I, I, I don't believe uh, Valve is privately owned, so they don't have any. So, so I think it's uh, it's going to be really interesting because, um, as I said, I, I've I've been traveling a lot, so I haven't been, I haven't really delved into the story what i what i glean is just from my twitter feed of mm -hmm. like reading little blurbs really quickly um that their argument was that he had violated some you know like player conduct type of thing which, which um, he did do yeah he violated a guideline which is basically well i believe the guideline was that uh if you cost if you do something to cost blizzard oh Okay. Uh, money. Well, it was essentially, if you did something to deface, De oh, defame Blizzard. or defa okay. Yeah. So if oh, I okay. like, if, so I'm a caster. Like, if I was to mm. say something totally insane mm. in a StarCraft cast, mm -hmm. like they don't have to pay me, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. 
and that it was punitive and that they took away his right. password. That was that, yeah, I thought that was a little bit punitive. But yeah. um, in terms of your question, I think it's going to be really interesting when you throw politics into things because as you said, what I think is so wonderful about gaming and for me, like what I see in the FGC um, is that it transcends politics. For instance, as you know, there's this whole trade war going on between Japan and Korea. I mean, it's gotten pretty, I don't know about violent, but like it's, it, the sentiment in Korea is like pretty anti I can't buy Japanese beer. Right so, now, so, right, yeah. right. So they won't, have, let, they won't let me at the convenience store if I try to. <laughs> we have, we have Japanese and Korean players. Um, and, and, um, they go back and forth to the different countries to compete. They're, they're actually good friends. And, um, and for me to, like go to a competition and see people from these different countries that are supposed to be kind of at odds with each other. They just want to play games and they're having fun. And you see like, you know, like Pakistan and India, they're not supposed to like each other. The players all respect each other's gameplay. They hang out after they play, you know, they go share meals together. Um, it doesn't matter if you're from like whatever social economic, what race, like you just, the love of the game and competition brings you together and you develop these like wonderful friendships and you don't necessarily let like politics and, and whatnot come into it. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I love, but then now when you start layering it and people have, people are allowed to express their um, opinions. I mean, in the US, you know, your freedom of speech, that's not true for other countries. So I can't, I, uh, you know, every country has their own their their their, their own set of rules. Um, but when you start layering in that, and then the whole international ownership and like power between like the the publishers, the corporations, the owners, the investors, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a really interesting um, next. And then uh, everyone's like uninstalling their like yeah <laughs> Blizzard games, and it's just I mean you see this in like even the U.S. if like a uh, religious thing, you know like boycott chick-fil-a Chick yeah. or like no support chick-fil-a and like so the the power of the purse how that's going to also it's it'll be really interesting um to see i'm going to be on the sideline looking and watching yeah it's it's, it's it so out. it's so weird i felt i've been making this joke with my friends but it feels like we're in i'm, I'm in a simulation right now as a starcraft caster mm -hmm. and seeing all, all this stuff happening to blizzard and, and how crazy this has all become um, kind of as a side question here. I mean, uh, a lot of this I feel is fueled by social media. Mm, it, oh. it, it seems like we're actually, too, in my opinion, we're actually too connected. Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel, do you feel like social media is, is, is bad for us or are we supposed to be unplugging more? I think it amplifies and it's that whole echo chamber thing. I mean, just with the elections in the U S um, what I saw, you know, with Facebook, I know the young people, you guys don't go on Facebook, but like, cause it's taken over by your moms and dads, but <laughs> and dad, during the last election cycle, my feed was just, it, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. So most of my high school friends are very, you know, Republican. And then my college friends are like super liberal and Democrat. And so I got to see both come up on my feed right yeah. but i think for most people it's one way and you just reinforce the the echo chamber right and so and with with gaming it's most of our communication is on on twitter um and you'll see something like we always call it what is it what do we say in the fgc something about tuesday like some shit always happens on tuesday right you get some <laughs> drama on tuesday i forget what the term is but it's like oh if some other like drama comes up it's like oh it's not even tuesday like what's going on right yeah, yeah. um but yeah things get blown out so quickly and then they also like die pretty quickly so i don't know i mean I don't want to sound like an old fart and be like, oh, you should unplug and get off social media. I don't think it's healthy a lot of times. And do people do like uh, unplug just for um, kind of mental breaks and things. But it's also like for us, it's like we need to be part of it. That's how we get our communication across so much of the community. That's where they get all the news, the gossip, whatever. Um, and so I can't unplug from it as much as I want to. But yeah, it's. I feel the same way. Like I have this big Twitter account that I hate, but I need to use it 
but I'm I'm I got off Facebook. I, I'm very happy I'm off Facebook. But yeah, I'm just wondering if people are getting crazier because of this. Because like what, what what's weird about I mean for me personally, it's just like I am a person of the internet, right? I grew up playing StarCraft. Mm-hmm. Um, I know so many people now globally. I could go to almost any country and have dinner with somebody that I isn't I that there. awesome though? It's so fucking cool. But at the same time, I feel this need to. Yeah, disconnect to, mm-hmm. like I, I don't want to share everything with everybody so that's time. something that you have to kind of i think um come to a dis- decision with as a you as a public uh, person right and um and going back to like uh, we were talking about how the news kind of glamorizes esports now um i mean i think that's what social media does especially like the Instagram era, right? You're only seeing like when they win or do all kinds of cool stuff. It's only positive just, stuff. Yeah, and like life kind of sucks most of the time, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> then you're like, ugh. So it makes the lows seem even lower because when you go on social media, you're only seeing other people's highs, right? And so I think, you know, intellectually we know that, but like when you open up your feet and you're having a bad day, like it's just so... I, <sighs> But it is it's it's here, and I I do know a lot of people that kind of unplug for a while. But um, you and I, we're kind of stuck, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what other trips do you have coming up here? What other trips? Um, so going back to London, um, we have a big tournament coming up. Um, EGX is a I don't know what it stands for, European Game Expo, maybe. That's a, that's um, a good guess. You're probably yeah, right. Yeah, something yeah. like that. And so there's a big Street Fighter. Um, premiere so my players are coming and we're gonna they're gonna stay with me we're gonna do some fun content in the house um invite a lot one of the things i love doing is like featuring um local players and things so when we did the dojo here my objective was to get the international audience to get to know more of the um lesser known local talents um and so I have still have to upload all of them to Twitter. But I just like <laughs> did little clips of like people that most people haven't heard of here. Um, and so uh, with um, folks in London, I mean, they're all pretty popular and, and famous because they're all really good. But showing a different side of them, like having them in the house, just playing and chilling and, and doing some fun activities. I would like to show the other side of, the pro gamer most times you just see them at a competition doing that like poker murder face as they're like you know concentrating and like whatever and then they get off the stage and that's it right but these guys like all of the guys and gals like they're just really really interesting unique people so i'm going to try to show more of that so if that in london and then um we're actually doing a, a dojo in pakistan too um i've heard about this yeah it's so exciting yeah so um one of our guys so um i think you talked to hassan um yeah. he's on our stream team and he crushed um, the podcast by yeah, the way he's yeah. amazing so um so so lucky to have him a part of you know part of the team um so he when i talked to him way back when i was asking him about you know joining being a, a, you know, as a content creator and whatnot, um, you know, he was saying like one of his his dreams and goals was to like um, help like shine light on the the, the Pakistan community, and um, and so with what um, I'm sure you probably heard of Arslan Ash um, when he like kind of just burst onto the scene at Evo Japan and then and also won this Evo, everyone's just like talking about like the scene like. Um, and um so Hassan and I were talking and I was like, you know, I said to him, you know, when we were talking about like I'd like to let's do a dojo there and we actually did a whole event where we like raised money and whatnot. Um and so we're doing a dojo um November third, um, and with a a local TO and once again, like I wanted to just that we as we did in um in Seoul, like working with a local uh TO to um, like kind of give them an opportunity to like uh, do something locally, but then have international eyes on it and um, train the folks to like um, kind of the, the standard of um, some of the international broadcasting competitions and just help the local scene like grow more, right? And, and so we'll try to like feature a lot of the lesser known players there as well and then the winner of that we're gonna um fly out to the last chance qualifier it's in bangkok and so the winner um 
yesterday, um, Lohai, who's on my team, actually won <laughs> the tournament. But um, we, uh, the um, highest placing non-sponsored person, they got their prizes to get flown out to Bangkok for the last chance qualifier. We're going to do that again in Pakistan, give the opportunity to somebody that's not sponsored um, to to go and like compete with the finalists there. Um, so we have that in Pakistan. I'll probably be going out to Dubai where there's a big tournament there that um, one of the Korean um, teams, Rocks and Rocks Gaming, um, they're kind of putting on one of the majors there. I haven't been to the Middle East yet. And so I'm excited to oh, go and see. Oh, it's going to be see. your first time. I haven't been yet either. Yeah. So um, I, I just really want to, I hope I, I I can go so that I can just kind of get to um, meet some of the folks in the in the scene. I mean, that's one of the reasons I was joking that I live on airplanes, but I think it's super important um, as you're understanding um, the community that you actually go to these tournaments, um, meet the people putting it on, meet the local folks that are. Uh, you know, competing, just the fans, the um, commentators, all of that. And each scene is slightly different. And so um, the Middle East, I, I just haven't, I haven't been out there. And so I, I'd really like to go out and kind of get to learn and, and support the scene. Going to these events, because I, I travel a decent amount to events. I'm always fascinated by the unique problems that can come up you know, in, in some country where you're trying mm -hmm. to run an event. Have you had encountered anything or had any interesting stories where, like, they're trying to run an event somewhere, but um, there's some law or regulation that's going to prevent something from happening? Or, uh, hmm. I mean, if not, no problem. I'm just curious because you, you've been traveling so much. Yeah, I'm sure. Be, this is a... Um, yesterday's event was the first time that I was involved in actually helping to to run a tournament. So... Um, I've been going more as a, a, a spectator and like supporter. I'm sure that there's all kinds of stories of rules and regulations. I know there's a lot of stories of players who have uh, a hard time like getting there for visa reasons or or whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll probably, as I, d I try to help more of these, we'll have interesting stories to, to tell you. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's 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 always fascinating to me, kind of seeing because this is so global, kind of finding finding out these unique problems, like for instance, Pakistani players not being able to get visas to go to oh, events. Oh yeah, it's uh, really hard. It's really tough it's, for them. Where yeah, yeah. Is that a government fix? Is that is that how that's sorted? Is is it like the Pakistani government would need to start issuing like a letter of request? To, like let's say it's in the U.S., the letter mm. of request there to. Uh, so Get that uh, sort of, I mean, I don't know how that. Really I don't works. know if the the Pakistani government, but I think each community, like um, we have this really great um program that um one of the members called Sherry Sherry Genix um in the U.S. She's a Street Fighter player um has been um really helping with and um, I, I may be wrong. I think it's called Game Game Pass, but she's been helping a lot of these players um from countries that have problems with visas and and advising them and and so um she's been able to get uh, them to successfully apply for visas so it is just a lot of it is information right so when you apply for a visa if you um, apply with a portfolio of like clippings of your winnings or news articles or like to to um support the fact that you are coming in as a gamer and why you're coming and you have letters of recommendation or you've got all of this type of thing, then most of the time you're going to get that visa and okay. get a yes, right? Um, and so it's a lot of knowledge sharing. And so she's been working with a lot of, um, you know, South American players, um, Middle Eastern players, people, players from Pakistan and, and, and been having good success. And so I think something like that, um, where you spread the knowledge and then those people that were successful can also help members in their community. And this is the right way to do it. You make sure you, these boxes are checked off. You make sure you have this and this is how you do an interview, right? Don't be nervous. Like she helps them like actually do mock interviews and all that um, for this. That's so, so, cool. so I, the community kind of when there's a problem, the community will often times come together to help come up with some some answers like that. So I just applaud people like her that are 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 doing that. Just to change topics here for a second before we wrap this up, I was curious your take on um, South Korea and how it's changed 
since you were young. Because <laughs> this country has transformed so massively. Yeah, um, I just, it's, it's so interesting because when I left, when I was six, I mean, we had latrines. Like, I didn't have running water. We, my mom cooked. Okay, so I remember like we had um, a pump in the middle of the courtyard. You had to prime the pump to get the water out. And then she cooked on, it was really a dirt floor. And then she would start the, the coal fire to cook the stuff. So that's like, I say that in my lifetime, but even like um, 20 years ago, Korea had changed so much. The first time I ever saw a toilet and it was one of those squat toilets, like I cried because I thought it was going to get sucked up in the hole, right? So I'm talking like... It, and so when we moved, it was like for a lot of opportunity and things, right? And um, now I kind of look at a lot of the Korean Americans that are in the States and you come back here and you think, oh, how would life have been different if we had just kind of stayed? No, one, I, I don't think any of the people that emigrated realized like how quickly the country had could, could change and the amount of innovation and wealth and like, I love coming here because I get so um, kind of like, I get a lot of inspiration from all the streetwear that's happening. Like all the, there's just so much vibrant, vibrant energy here. I just feel like stuff is being created and and things are happening. And um, the, the st I've been visiting a lot of startups here um, on this trip. Um, there's just like this cool, buzzy energy. Um, so yeah, it's... I mean, I'm I'm old, so when I'm talking to you about like dreams and <laughs> there's no TV and things like that, but I just look back in the pictures of like, yeah, it's just from the Koreans I've talked to, um, the ones that are like uh, expatriates, basically, so they're living overseas. Mm -hmm. When they come back here, they, they'll oftentimes say they're they're treated very differently by local Koreans. Have you had that experience? Mm, well, they all think I'm Japanese or Chinese because I don't speak very, <laughs> I don't speak Korean very well. But one time I visited with my parents and um, they're trying to order something and they, they um, couldn't get across to the waitress. And it's because they were using Korean from like 30 years ago. Like the, yeah, the, like, language, has the changed. language has changed, but they're using old terms from like oh, way back, way yeah. back when. And I find like a lot of the um, Korean Americans, they, they're actually even more conservative than the Koreans here because things have changed here and yeah. they, they're like kind of really conservative. But um, yeah, I just think everyone's, they, everything's like cooler and hipper here and I just feel really like, oh, really uncool. <laughs> like the other night after the tournament, I'm like walking in Hongdae and everyone looks like, oh man, they're so cool. And I was like, oh, I'll just go back home now. <laughs> like, do you, I mean, it must change, like for you too, like it must change in the uh, 10 it's become years much that... more. It's become much more cosmopolitan out here. Uh -huh. Like, So I've been out here for almost 12 years. And I remember, I mean, I was I was down at, I don't know if you know Nambu Terminal, but it's just a little bit south of Gangnam. Um, and I was the only foreigner mm -hmm. in the whole, like if there was another white guy that got on the train, I'm like, I'm like, who's this white guy? And like, your what, head what's... was like all taller than everyone yeah, else, I was like a, not a, anymore. Right? <laughs> yeah, everybody's gotten a lot. Like, I was like, how did People these got, Korean guys Korean, get so Koreans tall? got bigger. I don't know what happened. But... Like all six feet. Like, oh my God, I feel yeah. so short now. Okay. Yeah, no, it, but it's, it, <laughs> at the time it was like, I don't know. I felt way exotic, I guess. Mm. And, and now it's become such more, um, so much more a, a global yeah. city. It's so much more international uh -huh. now. Uh -huh. um, I wonder if the world's just become like because even when, like true. London, like um, when I was living in Cambridge. Oh gosh, though that was never mind. That was a long time ago. That was thirty years ago. Wow, wow. <laughs> I'm dating myself because I'm like, oh, that was before I had my son. He's twenty nine. So <laughs> never mind. I, that thirty years is a long time for things to change. Never mind. I take that back now. I think things it's are getting really cleaned up overall. Like everything's just getting nicer. Yeah, everything's like so much more international. And yeah. Things, so. Or maybe that's the positive side of the connectivity of the internet and information yeah. sharing. Or maybe if you like things to stay like culturally, like, you know, more, that's a negative. I don't, I, I don't know. When, when I left um, the States to move here, um, I was going to school in Colorado, but I was uh, from Kansas. But I remember going back to Kansas just a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. it was like it had totally transformed. All the cow pastures are like, you know, suburban McMansions, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. All these, and all, there's all these hip bars now yeah, that weren't there right. where I thought, I guess I left that place and left that time there as well. And I thought, 
it wouldn't change and, and I go Everything's back. Everything's hipster and, now. Yeah, right? now there's like arcades with bars and they're people playing <laughs> Smash Brothers in there. And I'm like, what's going on? This is crazy. <laughs> um, since we're talking about Korea, and I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this at all, but w- what's your take on um, you know North Korea and South Korea and this whole debacle? Do you have a- any thoughts on this? Or, or are they just going to get nuclear weapons? Or I is hope there, I, I just wonder... It's always it's on my mind since I'm out here. Yeah. It's like when you live in Tokyo, earthquakes are always on your mind. Yeah. But then yeah. you kind of forget about it, right? Yeah. But um yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 pretty non political, but yeah. from just like a humanitarian point of view, like I just um I wish that there were more like um, conversation just because from the humanitarian point, um, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of volunteer work in the U.S. for Korean Americans, like on the board of Council of Korean Americans, and um, I know a lot of the members have families from North Korea, and they do a lot of whether it's like medical or like uh, like hunger issues and, and working with the UN and and whatnot and trying to give aid to to North Korea, and so they kind of work at it from that angle versus like I don't. You know, from from the political angle, which is so much more nuanced. Um, but yeah, it's been going on for. I'm I'm just a, I'm just a business owner. I, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I just, just always wonder because I've you know I follow it so closely now that I've been out here, and mm-hmm. I just wonder mm-hmm. as long as I'm out here, is this thing ever going to get resolved or, or what? But I don't know. I, it's like there's always like a little bit of hope, and then you go like one. Is it like it's. Not two steps forward, one step back. It's one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's heartbreaking, actually. How did, how did this podcast go for you? Did you enjoy this? Yeah, we kind of just talked all over. We can talk about anything. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the first po- it's the first podcast I've ever done. You did thank really you well. For yeah, thank you. Asking me to come on. I wasn't thank sure you what to on. expect. Fact, and I don't know if I have anything interesting for people to listen to, but I think people are going <laughs> to love it. Here, let's uh, let's cut here, and then we'll go to the post show. Um, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, I think Jin He is a really interesting person, uh, and I wish her and the rest of the UIU team the best of luck in the future. Uh, we're going to be coming back again with another episode uh, next week. Uh, as usual, we don't have any StarCraft in December, so I'm totally free. Uh, I do have a little vacation coming up that I'll be taking right before Christmas. And, um, yeah, uh, guys, again, hold on. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Getting nose blue balls right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Guys, thank you so much for um, for joining me for this episode. And... Uh, Again, support on Patreon really goes a huge way. Patreon.com forward slash Tasteless Podcast. Is there anything else we need to announce, Ryan? I think that just about does it. That just about does it. All right, guys. I should not be sick for the next recording. I'm I'm sure I'll have recovered by then. Um, I'll see you guys next week. I love you. Take care. Bye-bye. This podcast was produced by Ryan. Artwork by Alarise. Music by Mark Lentz. Special thanks to our top Patreon supporters. Seth Rohit Sambadi, Charlie Shiver, John Kernicki, and Tyler Tebow Baggins Radsek. I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye. <laughs>